We'd like to welcome you to another in a series of webinars designed for Departments of Transportation. I'm Terry Bills, and I'm the Transportation Industry Manager here at ESRI. And today I'm joined by Eric Nutt from Manly Communications and Stan Burns from Integrated Inventory, both good partners of ESRI. Today's webinar is focused on best practice in collecting and managing your asset data for better asset management practice. And this is an area of great interest to DOTs as they've come to recognize the importance of good asset management practice in preserving their infrastructure. But that said, it's still an area where most DOTs grapple with establishing good workflows and building effective systems to help them make better investment decisions. In today's webinar, we hope to show you what we consider to be best practice in terms of asset data collection, and then how you can turn that data into good, actionable intelligence. But before we begin, I'd like to point out that we're, we are recording this webinar, and while everyone will be on mute, there will be time for question and answers at the end of the presentation. You can type your questions into the question box, and we'll try to answer as many as time allows. Additionally, the slides which are part of this webinar will be available to you on the GeoNet group, Departments of Transportation, and we'll give you the link at the end of the webinar. To start, let me state the obvious, that the goal of asset management is really the better management of our public infrastructure and the best ways to preserve the life of those public assets. As you'll hear from Stan later in the webinar, in Utah, they believe that good roads cost less. And by that, they mean that if you maintain and take care of the roads over their lifetime, they can be effectively maintained for less cost over their life cycle. But such an approach fundamentally depends on having good data and good methods of analysis to assist the asset manager in making timely, preservation decisions. Which leads to the second main point of asset management, that we want to be able to plan for our maintenance expenditures and develop longer-term capital maintenance budgets, in essence, to amortize the cost of maintenance into a regularized schedule. The last thing that elected officials want to see are budget requests that swing wildly but rather what they want to know is the level of expenditure to maintain highway assets at a given level of condition and performance. And finally, we want to be able to have a full accounting of our maintenance costs so that we can better understand our full life cycle costs. So in that regard, I think the winter storm calculator that Iowa DOT puts on their website is a brilliant effort to help educate the public of the costs of maintaining roadways clear of snow. We should all think about having similar calculators for pavement sections or for bridges. Maintenance activities typically consume as much as 70% of any project's full life cycle costs. So maintaining good maintenance data allows us to better understand those total costs in the project planning stages. And that's to say nothing of the fact that we can better manage our maintenance activities if we're carefully tracking our efforts. One of the reasons why asset management has become so important for DOTs in the US is that a required component of MAP21 and the FAST Act. These transportation authorization bills require that every state DOT demonstrate that they've implemented a performance-based transportation asset management plan, or a TAMP, to preserve and maintain their assets. And while certainly would, some would certainly argue that many of these concepts were first laid out back in 1991 under the ICE-T Act, Nevertheless, the latest transportation bills require that states show that they are actively managing the maintenance of their core highway assets. And certainly, Federal Highways, TRB, and AASHTO have spent considerable effort in education on best asset management practice. The goal is really to move from reactive maintenance, which tends to be much more costly over the long run, 
to proactive and ultimately predictive asset management and maintenance so that we can greatly reduce the risk of failures and significantly reduce the life cycle costs of maintenance. And in fact, states are required to demonstrate that they've included a risk analysis in their overall asset management plans. And risk is probably a newer concept for many asset managers, but it's been a part of best practice in the asset management literature for some time. We at ESRI participate in asset management conferences in Europe. They've developed very structured processes for asset management and risk calculation. And in fact, it's often required of all major infrastructure agencies as a result, their insurance rates and their future funding is often contingent on following these best practices. What they once called PASS 55 is now ISO 55000, and it is the gold standard for asset management practice. Risk managers calculate a risk profile for every asset, and risk is a function of the likelihood of failure times the consequence of failure, as we see in this graphic taken from the water industry. These calculations should help every asset manager to prioritize their capital projects with higher consequence projects scoring considerably higher than lower consequence assets. For example, if a bridge which provides one of the main access points to a city were to fail, as we saw in the interstate 35 bridge in Minneapolis, then the consequences are quite significant. So the consequence of failure is a function of the criticality of the asset, and that often is a function of its location. As I mentioned, the concepts of risk management and asset management are much better known in Europe, and in fact, the European Commission has commissioned several studies highlighting the role of GIS in risk assessment. We've put this and several other good resources on a final resource page, which we'll make available at the end of the webinar. But now, let me turn this over to Eric Nutt, who will talk about how to collect good asset information and how to build that asset registry. So, Eric? Great, thank you very much, Terry, I appreciate it. Um, I'd like to thank everybody at Esri for inviting me to uh, take part of this webinar. I'm excited to, uh, to share a little bit about Manly Communications and uh, our involvement in the transportation industry. So I will uh, dig right in and uh, talk a little bit about our data collection practices. Uh, let me start with a brief background about Manly Communications. Uh, Manly is a company that's based in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, there is a, a picture of our building in much warmer times uh, than currently. Um, Manly's been around for about 35 years, um, and many, uh, I would say the majority of those years, we have uh, worked closely with state departments of transportation uh, to do a, a number of things, but, but um, I think with respect to this, uh, webinar, uh, a lot of data collection for the purposes of asset management. Um, so we have a large mobile mapping fleet, and over the years we have collected um, over 600,000 miles of um, 3D data from LiDAR sensors um, and extracted from <clears throat> that LiDAR data that has been collected uh, over 4.2 million assets that have been delivered to the states that we contract with. So uh, the company is about 160 people, and, and all of them are located in a building just outside of Madison, Wisconsin. So the uh, a critical focus that, that we have at Manly is really related to minimizing the cost of collecting the kind of data required uh, to support uh, robust asset management systems. Uh, so we start with a multifunctional vehicle, um, and by that, that, what we mean really is um, we want to be able to drive down the road once, uh, single pass, and, and use the latest technology available to ensure that um, we, we get a good record of the state of the infrastructure um, surrounding the vehicle. Uh, so that includes imaging, uh, pavement uh, imaging in 3D profiles, 
um, very accurate uh, GPS positions and, and LIDAR. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of those sensors later, but um, we also, uh, since 2007, have been developing our own LIDAR extraction software, um, which enables us to, um, to do extremely efficiently be able to extract information from the collected data, um, really to get it in the hands of, of the DOT customers that need to make the kinds of decisions um, that Terry mentioned based on risk and, and the current state of the infrastructure. Uh, so a critical component of our efforts is related to uh, quality control, and I just want to throw, throw a couple things out there. Um, one is that uh, we have a dedicated internal team um, that's main focus is on <clears throat> ensuring that our data collection vehicles are, uh, are, are ready to deploy, and ready to, de to deploy means that uh, we have a very strong indication that they will produce uh, the accuracy um, and repeatability that we, um, I think, are well known for in the industry. So, so we really care about producing quality data, and that, that team's job is to ensure that our vehicles are ready to go. Uh, throughout the collection process, when, when a vehicle is deployed, we also have uh, quite rigorous uh, daily, and weekly, and pre- and post-project collection activities um, th that are intended to uh, validate that the vehicle is continuing to operate appropriately. Um, we also have established uh, it workflows uh, during our data reduction processes um, that have been refined over the course of, of the last 10 years and more um, to ensure that what's being produced um, as far as the assets that are being delivered is of the, of the highest quality uh, that we can produce. So here's a, a quick picture of our, our in-house facility with our data uh, reduction staff uh, working away. So next I want to talk a little bit more about data collection. So here's an example vehicle um, with some bullet points about the kinds of sensors that, that are included in the vehicle. Um, I will dig into some more sensor details here in a second. Here are a couple other examples of data collection vehicles we have produced. Um, all of the integration of these systems is done in-house, so Manly works very closely with, uh, with customers to understand their needs and outfit these vehicles with the appropriate sensors um, you know, for, for the assets that need to be uh, provided as a part of the contracts we work with. So we have a lot of experience doing that, and we, we love to, to work with safety OTs to understand what their needs are so we can make sure that they are met uh, as best as possible. Uh, here's a quick video um, showing <clears throat> a, a bit of the LiDAR data that is produced with one of these vehicles, and, and this video is highlighting uh, some of the assets that we have uh, extracted from this data set. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about how we extract that data uh, in just a minute, but hopefully this um, video can give everyone a, a decent idea of the kind of data that, that our mobile mapping system is creating. Uh, generally a 3D point cloud um, with an accuracy, a relative accuracy of around plus or minus two and a half centimeters um, and an absolute accuracy generally within one meter. Um, but we do have some experience uh, controlling the data set to get better absolute accuracies as well. So um, if there are questions about that, we can, we can uh, talk about that later. Uh, the, the LiDAR sensor that we typically use is an HDL32. This is a, a sensor produced by Velodyne. Um, we often use two of them um, in support of the single pass missions uh, that we, we prefer to, to pursue um, that allows more, uh, better coverage with uh, less obstruction from surrounding vehicles. And as I mentioned, we get around uh, two and a half centimeter relative accuracy and about 1.4 million points per second. Um, the imaging system that our vehicles have uh, are also typically uh, three cameras uh, facing forward, um, generally five to eight megapixels. So they are, are, are pretty high resolution and you can zoom in quite far and still uh, be able to analyze the state of the infrastructure, the assets, um, and especially the condition of assets from quite far away. Here are a couple examples of, or sorry, uh, some specifications of the cameras we use. Uh, we're always looking to improve cameras, and I know this year we'll, we'll, we're expecting to roll out 
some some whole new camera offerings with with higher specifications and and better uh, better imagery. So look forward to that. I also wanted to quickly mention that uh, as of this year, uh, Manly has signed an agreement with TomTom, Tom, um, a global leader in data collection um, and navigation systems, to be able to license their their pre collected data set. Um, and just a quick couple notes about that. This is really, uh, from Manley's perspective, uh, a great opportunity for an alternative collected data source um, that has a couple advantages in terms of coverage and cost and time to acquire. So uh, really the, the, the brief information about the data set that's available uh, is generally that the top four functional classes are collected every two years um, and some additional collection is available. Uh, Manly has been working hard to uh, distill the knowledge that we've gained from many contracts over the years with state DOTs to target uh, standardized data packages uh, at, at specific divisions or, or with as much cross-divisional uh, popularity as, as we can. So we have um, the packages target uh, needs from the state DOT side, including HPMS reporting, uh, operations and maintenance and safety divisions, um, and several of the packages um, support all of those divisions at the same time as well. So pulling that together. Uh, after we've collected all of the data, um, I mentioned we have a reduction staff. So, so the asset extraction process is something that we have uh, homegrown and refined over many years and, and many, many miles of data collection. So here's a quick list of some of the actual uh, assets that we have extracted and delivered to state DOTs um, in support of several of, the, of those divisions that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I want to make it clear kind of from a best practices perspective, one of the things that, that we've found to be true um, and, and critical to ensuring success of a data collection project is, is working with the state DOTs and, and if you're a state DOT employee working with the vendors, um, to, to really run through and have a, a clear understanding of the assets you care about, um, descriptions of those assets, um, and, and all of the attributes of those assets that you really care about. Um, this, is, this is a thing that Manly has, I think, become quite good at and, and done quite a bit of. So we have a lot of experience building what we call data dictionaries um, that, that really help to ensure that what's going to be delivered to the DOT can be um, used, you know, used appropriately and has all of the right information. Um, so that's a, a critical step. And here were just some examples. Um, often we run into cases where where different DOTs have different um, definitions for uh, for pole types, for example, for streetlights, um, or, or different categories of of sign post types that that they care about. So. Um, it's critical to uh, focus on and get that narrowed down at the beginning. Uh, here's another kind of quick example of the software that, that we use to extract the asset data. Um, this is just to help give you uh, an understanding of the environment that we work in. And, and we, we work inside of the 3D environment and, and we have tools uh, that are automated, semi-automated and uh, fully manual across the board for supporting uh, our extraction of the asset information. Uh, so all of the attributes that, that we decide on from the pick lists and the data dictionary would go into um, into configuring this environment so that we are sure we are producing what what we are you know what the state needs. Uh, here's a quick example of a vertical clearance um, tool that we have for uh, uh, structure uh, vertical clearance measurements. And another quick example of um, uh, mapping that we have done in, in information extraction for uh, pavement lane information and, and, and road widths. Uh, here's a quick example of integrating that data. So all the data that we uh, collect, we, um, we, we very often deliver in, um, in formats that are compatible with Esri software. Um, we found that that is is one of the the common tools that, that people really enjoy using, and I know Stan is going to talk more about that. So I won't talk a lot about it, but I will say that we have significant uh, experience integrating 
the asset information that we deliver into enterprise uh, ESRI and uh, other systems uh, in the state DOT to ensure that the states get the most value they can out of that data. Uh, I also want to mention we are working very closely with ESRI uh, to ensure that ESRI clients have easier um, ways in which they uh, to get access to this kind of data. So if you have more questions about that, feel free to reach out to, to any of us uh, and we'll be able to fill you in on more info on that. Uh, I'm going to show a quick example of uh, another integration. This is a, a video showing um, some UDOT data. Uh, so this is more of an ESRI environment. Uh, we have some other tools in which uh, to help support viewing the data that's been collected. So once you have all of your asset information, you may want to easily reference the data that was collected uh, to, to go and actually drive the road uh, where that asset is to take a closer look at what's going on in, in the real world uh, around that asset. And, and we have several tools available to help uh, make, that, make that possible. <clears throat> um, yeah, so that's all I had. Thank you very much. All right, we'll turn it over to Stan and uh... Stan, take it away. Thank you, Terry. Uh, thank you for giving Eric and I the opportunity of presenting today. And uh, you can see I'm going to share my screen and put it in presentation mode. Okay. So today, I want to continue on what Terry and Eric talked about, is this integration of asset information to make good decisions. And uh, some of you may know that I recently retired from Utah Department of Transportation two years ago. I was the director of asset management. So I'm going to talk, continue this discussion about, you know, how do you collect the data? How do you organize it to do analysis and ultimately to save resources and time? Um, this is probably one of the more challenging questions I was asked when I was at the Utah Department of Transportation by the Transportation Commission. And it would go something like the following. If you had one dollar, one last dollar, or your first dollar, where would you allocate it? Would you allocate it on bridge, safety, pavement, mobility, maintenance? And, and the most difficult part of that question is, what is the expected performance? if you give uh, allocate that dollar to a bridge as opposed to pay but the people in the bridge department have this same dilemma they have a limited budget where should they spend where should they allocate dollars and what's the expected benefit to the bridge program or the safety pavement mobility so all people at the dot face this dilemma how to allocate dollars appropriately so the way we tackled this in utah was we show the ideal of what uh, an integrated transportation system would look like. And I'll briefly describe this graph. But when we wanted to articulate the aspiration of where we wanted to go, we showed this graph. In the middle, you can see ArcGIS, the data integration hub. And on the outside of the wheel, starting at 12 o'clock, you can see the STIP program. And then design, construction, and you can probably understand what I'm what I'm going to just say here is you know, projects flow from from the step to design, construction. Then they go into the operation side of the house, maintenance, traffic, and safety. But what I wanted to talk about is each one of these groups produce data every day. And each day they consume data from their colleagues. So as an example, my group down here at 7 o'clock, data management, collected an awful lot of data, traffic data, uh, LRS data, asset data. The people up here at 12 o'clock, the STIP, needed to know what data I had. So when they put together a project, they could look and see how much money had been spent on those assets. They wanted to talk to maintenance at five o'clock to say, what is, the most, what is the most costly attenuator example on this roadway? But the designers, when a project went to design, they wanted to know how many crashes took place 
on that section of roadway. So this idealized aspirational graph here is saying that every day traffic and safety produces data. It goes into the ArcGIS data portal. Designers can grab it, Advice, and vice versa also. When that project is designed, traffic and safety people need to know. So the design goes into ArcGIS. So this is a difficult concept sometimes to articulate. What is this integrated system? So we'd always show this graph, understanding that everybody needs authoritative, timely data. And we found that the key was Put it in ArcGIS, show it on a map, share your data, be collaborative, and as we say, break down those silos. So the way we started at UDOT was to articulate the vision of integration of data. We needed, we needed to collect authoritative data. So in 2011, Utah went out with an RFP, and the goal was to collect every asset above ground from fence post to fence post and certain attributes associated with those assets like Eric showed. Uh, we did not specify LIDAR, but the winning contractor was Manly Communications. And so on the bottom left, I'm showing you LIDAR, and you saw that from Eric's presentation, uh, high definition cameras. And so this is the tools that Manly came to UDOT with and said, we will collect everything above ground for you. And also pavement distress, as Eric said, Put on that one vehicle all the instruments you can so you drive the road once for everyone. And so in Utah, they drove uh, both sections of the roadway. You can see the number of centerline miles, about 6,000, 14,000 uh, driven miles. But the, the best part of the project, I think, was we, it wasn't my group that did this. Uh, my group is down here, was down here planning and programming. We had maintenance, traffic and safety, structures, GIS, IT, motor carriers, pre-construction, right away all, in all four regions working together. Uh, these top three helped pay for this. Uh, we got uh, some money from motor carriers. We didn't get any money from pre-construction or right away, but that didn't exclude them from taking part because they, we knew they were instrumental in this project. They needed good asset data to be able to do their designs. And right away, needed to know where those billboards were. So it was a collaborative effort to show this vision of what can happen when you work together. So why didn't we use this other option, which is called boots on the ground? Why did we use, we looked at this actually, and we decided to go with the mobile LIDAR imaging you know, manly communications. Why didn't we go with boots on the ground? Well, actually, I, I tried doing this when I was the operations engineer at UDOT in 1998, 20 years ago. Um, I had a couple of uh, crew members who were very dedicated. They wanted to collect all 101,000 signs. Well, it's quite a few signs, but they gave it a go. But then they wanted to expand the attribute table. So they started doing the width and the height of those signs. They located the signs with DMIs, uh, the three steel posts, the lettering, uh, the color, the condition. And then they started collecting pavement striping. And this was challenging, as you might imagine. Um, the shield, I-15, the north lettering. Uh, you can see the two, four, two sets of four-inch uh, yellow lines and the eight-inch white line. And so it became overwhelming. Uh, we tried doing this for two to three years. Uh, I do know that uh, technology has changed quite a bit in 20 years, uh, but I had dedicated crew that really wanted to collect the inventory. So that's why when we looked at it in 2011, we said, you know, boots on the ground are important to keep up a good database of assets you have. And so that's what Utah is doing now. They have this repository base from Manly, and they supplement it with boots on the ground now. So collect once for everyone. They use this technology from Manly. And they, they collected in 12, 2012, 14, 16, and they just uh, finished late 2017. So it's become institutionalized at UDOT now. 
But the, the next slide I want to talk about is the future is now. And Eric briefly talked about this. This is the po uh, partnership with Tom, Tom, and Manley. I'm showing you Texas, the state of Texas. And you can here's the Gulf Coast, uh, Corpus Christi. You can see uh, Houston and Dallas Fort Worth area. I'm showing you all the roads that Tom Tom has driven in the state of Texas and parts of Oklahoma, Mexico, Louisiana. These are the top four functional classes that Eric mentioned. They have uh, LIDAR, they're LIDAR 32s, they have high definition cameras. This partnership with Manly now is that they can go to states and say, maybe you don't have to do this data collection from scratch. Maybe you already have it in the can. And I'll zoom in here a little bit closer. Then you can see the big cities of Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, et cetera. And now here are the roads of Austin, Texas. So this is a breakthrough in the last you know, six, seven years since uh, Utah did this data collection RFP. Now Texas, 64 countries, 50 DOTs have data in the can. They have LIDAR, they have imaging, uh, Manly can extract the data for them. So there's been a big change from boots in the ground to collect it once for everybody to now the whole country has the four top functional classes. Those are interstates, expressways, principal arterials, minor arterials, and then some collectors, major and minor. So just to reiterate, this is the kind of information that any state DOT, city or county have access to now. It's in the can. So all of these assets in this picture, you know, this collaboration between Manly and TomTom can provide to a, a city, a county, a state. So the cable barrier, the attenuation you're seeing, uh, the down in the bottom part of the picture, the rumble strips, the width of these travel lanes, the presence of the striping, et cetera. And everything in this picture, states, cities, and counties have the option now. The sign, the lettering on the sign, the condition of the sign. Uh, up here we have luminaires, uh, cameras, CCC TVs, uh, the acreage of that architectural feature, landscape architectural feature. Data that's in the can from a Tom Tom Manly collaboration to where do you put all this information? And the big breakthrough at Utah was when the former uh, GIS director Frank Fazzani came to me and said, Stan, instead of putting that Manly data into business applications, which UDOT does, the OMS, the payment management system, let's put it into that central data hub, ArcGIS. That was the big breakthrough at UDOT. So instead of someone having to have a desktop application for the payment management system or the OMS system, they had, if they had a browser, they could access this. So what I'm showing you today, and you can, uh, when we share this uh, PowerPoint with Terry later on, you can click on this link right here and it will take you to the data portal, Utah data portal. This is all public. So everything I'm showing you is public information. So I'll show you a little bit about this, but the big, big take home here was no one at UDOT ever had to come to me and say, Stan, I know Manly collected those images for you. Can you direct me to where those images are? Or I know Manly collected signs for you. Can you direct me to where those signs are? They were all there in the geospatial data portal. I just said, go to the geospatial data board. And they said, you mean you plan? And I said, yes, you um, plan has all this information. So I'll give you a little bit of a run through of what you plan is. Uh, across here is what they call the ribbons. These are predefined apps. You can see this APP here. So this is a snowplow tracking app that UDOT created. Here's an app for the live stip. Here's an app for the long range plan, and here's an app for where the images are. The key here was that you make the data available to the staff, whether it's snow plows, whether it's a stip, whether it's asset data, make it available, and the staff will make these apps. 
So my group did not make these apps. Frank Bazzani and GIS did not make these apps. It was the maintenance people working with the GIS group that made these apps. If you make the data available, people will find uses for it in their particular division. Uh, down here under gallery, what you'll find is that many states now have a gallery set up for the maintenance division or the payment management division or the safety division. So what they do is they found that they had trouble sharing within their own division two years ago, three years ago now. So now they have a gallery for their division, the maintenance division, traffic and safety division. Uh, this is another way we subdivided uh, UDOT and it's by regions. So if you wanted to find everything about region three, that's this darker line here. And then later on, I'll show you how you can build an app on the fly. Uh, anything you want to do is, is possible now that the data is available. So the first thing I'm gonna show you is an app that UDOT built uh, where they link together data from design database, the construction database, the LRS database, the financial database, four databases. So it's Utah, the status of projects. So this is real time. I, I did these screen captures yesterday of Utah's construction projects. The green dots represent construction projects in the northern half of Utah. And here I'm just clicking on one and you can see project information. The pin, it's a passing lane project on I-80 in Parley's Canyon going up to Park City. It's under construction. But then I can go to the layer list, and here I've clicked on design, as you can see, but I could have clicked on projects in plan, studied, et cetera, but I clicked on projects in design. So the next screen capture is just showing the yellow dots with the green dots, the yellow dots are in design, and I've clicked on one of those yellow dots in design, and you can see it's, it's an off-system project, it's a bridge project in the town of Hoytsville, so you can see the, the, con the contact information, name, number, email address. And then this is more information on that project. This is you know, the year it's going to start. It's going to be done October 18th. And here's the dollar amount. And then finally, the last slide is I could have also done screen captures for you on city, county, MPO. I want to know how many projects are in my legislative district. I want to, if I live on a state road, I want to know which projects you have planned, which projects are in the construction, when they're going to be done. So the way I call this app is, it can be called the Project Online Viewer, or it can be the Friday afternoon at four o'clock app. We all got, we, well, I used to get these when I worked at UDOT. I know you all get them. You get a call from the public, your colleagues, senior leaders, the press, legislators saying, I want to know all the projects you have scheduled in my city for next year. How many you have in construction right now, if they're on schedule, if they're not. And I want to compare my city with another city. So these are these calls at Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock you get and you scramble. You're probably not going to have an answer by the end of the day. You might have an answer Monday or Tuesday. Uh, so this helps answer those kind of questions. But the power of this is mashing together those four business systems I talked about, those four databases, and putting them on a map for everybody to see. Another example I want to show you is, uh, this is another Esri map, that uh, Esri app. It's what happens, what happened to my district while the, over the weekend? So I call this the Monday 8 o'clock a.m. What's the situation? So let's say you're, you work in a district or a region, you can have an app built for you that says, I want to know all the crashes that happened over the last week or last month. I want to know where the construction projects are. Are we on schedule or not? I want to know if the crews have uh, done the striping on city road or county road or state road X. So this is a, like a, a dashboard for senior leaders. They can say what has happened to the district, the region in the last month, the last week, etc. Another app that Esri is building for states is, is called uh, the Forensic Material Forensic App or the Structure App. And the way this goes is 
uh, materials. Uh, materials have asked us to build an app that says, I want to know all the projects where we assessed a penalty based on uh, low air or low concrete breaks or paving out of, se out of season or asphalt mixed with too much oil, any one of those things, create a heat map. So this could be all the places where all the construction projects have taken place over the last five years. This could be where we have the majority of the construction projects. Uh, these could be where we had penalties assessed for non-compliance. Structures Forensic, they wanted to do something very similar. They wanted to show all of their structures on a map, they all, but they also wanted to say something. I want to know where a specific expansion joint was used. I want to know where I use a specific type of barrier or parapet or overhead sign structure. In other words, we get lost with the data. And these two groups have talked to us specifically. We get lost in the data. We have too much data. We need to show in a mapping format, a heat mapping format, not only where the structures are, but where we have a specific type of expansion joint or a specific type of where we use green rebar or we didn't use green rebar. So these are apps that you can build once you have the data. Uh, finally, this is an app that I just built yesterday to show you. I'm showing you in real time the safety of roads in the state of Utah, green, yellow, red, and black. And it means exactly what you might think it means. The green are relatively safe roads. We're comparing rural roads to rural roads, urban interstate to urban interstate. So this is UDOT's way of saying, where are the relative safe roads and where are the roads we have to work on? So I just pulled this as public information. I pulled this off ArcGIS UPlan site yesterday. And then I took this screen capture. This is the Wasatch Front. Same idea. It's the roads, good, fair, poor from a safety standpoint. And you can see now, you can see more black. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer. And I'm going to draw your attention to these two roads here. These are roads uh, uh, going to the ski resorts out of uh, Salt Lake County, Alta, Snowbird, Brighton, Solitude. But if you notice, I want to draw your attention to this right here. EPM funded projects by program, sign, mile post. What I did is I just went here and I added these to the filter. As easy as just searching on them and adding them. But you can see I don't have them checked on. I, have the, I don't have to check there. Just safety. So I'm going to go to the next slide. And what have I done? You see a lot of colors. And I've zoomed into those two canyon roads. Here's the one going to one, two sets of ski resorts. These, this is the one going to Alta Snowbird. And I've checked signs in poor, fair, and good condition. And I've checked signs that are speed limit signs. So what you are looking at right now is the data that Manly collected for UDOT. They rated the signs good, fair, poor. So the yellow signs are fair. The red signs are poor. These signs are speed limit signs. And the reason why this is important is this road is relative, has a relatively high crash rate. It's red. So the, the safety engineer or the district engineer for Region 2 can ask the question, I wonder what the speed limits are on this section of road that has this high crash rate. Well, you don't have to drive out there anymore. You can all have the same conversation. It's not, this is all in somebody's head. This is on, this is on the internet for anybody who has a browser. Anybody who has, uh, can go to RGS Uplan and see this. So you can ask those what if questions. So I'll go to another screenshot and I'm going to zoom in on one particularly poor sign, a red sign. And here it is right here. So I'm, I'm showing you all the attributes that Manly collected. The MUTCD code, it's an arrow. There's the width, uh, the feet above uh, roadway. You can see that, it's on one post. It's in poor condition because it has graffiti. You can ask the question, what if we had those signs were knocked over, if they were poorly faded? Um, then you can say, we're, we're in the S turn right here. We need to have probably have these signs in very good condition uh, because this uh, this road has a relatively high crash rate. And then, as Eric showed earlier, you know, 
we didn't ask Manly just to do assets. We also had them do imaging. And here's the image of this poor sign. You can see the graffiti on this sign in the upper right-hand corner. And I will expand it a little bit for the audience to see. You can see the graffiti there. And uh, so I'm, I have to log out of that. And so what I showed you quickly is just how to build an app for a particular section of roadway. And then finally, I wanted to show you, are there any projects in this part of Utah? And so I turned on EPM funded projects by program. And I checked that and I checked every single box here, capacity projects, transportation, pavement, structures, traffic and safety by point and length, freight, joint highway, TAP, and environmental studies. I had to expand out because there are no projects planned in this section of these two roadways. But there is data all at your fingertips. It's authoritative. It's not, as I said before, the domain of just a few experts in your department. It's shared across the platform. And the real key here was make it available to your colleagues. Don't put it on your desktop. As I said, no one ever had to come to me and say, can you show me the images? Can you show me the assets? I never, I don't have to go to the people in charge of the STIP. I didn't have to do that when I was at UDOT. I don't have to do that now. It's right here at your fingertips. I didn't have to go to the safety engineer to find out the relative safety of roads. It's right there. It's this idea of sharing data. And then here is just the legend of what all these projects mean. And so this is a preservation project. Here is a, a, a higher preservation project. Here is a capital improvement project. So data at your fingertips. And finally, the last example I'll show you, and then we'll break for questions, is you know, it's stress that Eric said that you know, we they put every kind of instrument that is available on those vehicles. So then the client, like I used to be, I don't have one vehicle driving for pavement distress, another vehicle driving for images, the third driving from for assets, and possibly three different contractors. It's one contractor with all of this. And the last thing I'll show you is. They collected pavement distress for UDOT, and they still do. So I'm showing you downward looking image of a section of road in Utah, and I'm showing you the wheel path cracking. I'm showing you the, the fatigue cracking right down the middle of that rut, which is really critical for structural strength of that asphalt. But uh, they also identified all the longitudinal cracking and transverse cracking. And the colors represent just what you might think green, yellow, red means the severity of the cracking. So what did UDOT do with that? It goes back to that first slide I showed you. In payment, we were able to say, with the proper data, we could tell what an extra dollar would achieve for the department and where the last dollar should be spent. So Terry talked about risk and the importance of risk, uh, identifying risk. I'm showing you low volume road in the state of Utah. And this is probably one of the more, most important graphs that Utah has. It's the condition of low volume roads. Utah could not practice good roads cost less. They did not have funding to, to do preservation and rehabilitation on the entire system. So they did triage. They took low volume roads, which were less than a thousand vehicles a day, and said, we're going to maintain those as best we can. And you can see only $10 million. Every year, the legislators would ask and the governor would ask, what would it take to change the downward trend of this graph? You can see the red, and here's the year 2020. I left, retired in Utah right here, 2016, so my data is a little bit old. But every year we would say, this is what the downward trend is, and they would agree with this because they understood we had to protect the interstates and the principal arterials where the traffic was. But we, we gave them this graph. This is what the change would be if if you allocated $50 million to low volume roads. So right here, you can see the difference. Every year they ran the bill, every year they lost to get a gas tax increase until 2015. 2015, they passed the nickel gas tax, not only based on engineering judgment, institutional knowledge, but, but this graph, sorry, 
that graph. I'm having trouble with my mouse here. So the, what I wanted to end my presentation is if you make the data available, people can make good decisions. And based on this last example I showed you, the department was able to show legislators and the governor, if you spend, if you increase gas tax by five cents, it will translate to $50 million. $50 million will translate from a downward trend to an upward trend on poor conditions of road, increasing the good, decreasing the red. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back to Terry and I'll stop showing my screen, Terry. Okay, thanks, Stan, and thanks, Eric. Uh, again, uh, please uh, type your questions into the uh, into the uh, question box, and we'll uh, we'll answer a number of those questions uh, for you now. Uh, the first question, uh, Eric, is actually for you, and it's. Uh, the question is, uh, how do you ensure that the accuracy of the data that you collect is in line with the standard operating procedures regarding data collection of the organization that you're working with? Oh, thanks, Harry. <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think it, it comes down to um, having really good open conversations uh, throughout the RFP and negotiation and early project phases um, to ensure that both sides uh, clearly understand um, what activities are being performed um, from a quality control perspective, uh, what the performance expectations are, um, and uh, I think Manly ensures uh, that we are achieving that through uh, you know, the, those, those rigorous early on discussions uh, as well as being as open and, and, and transparent as we can be about um, the processes we are going to use to to ensure that we achieve uh, the, the required performance specifications. All right, and then uh, let's see. Um, has any of the presenters had experience with integrating high accuracy CAD files created for the engineering design and construction of capital projects? Uh, and uh, I guess the first off, uh, uh, probably not something that uh, Manly has done. Uh, Stan, did you uh, try to do that any any of that uh, at uh, Utah? Yes. So, so Terry, the question was: Has have people used uh, this information to design or? No, actually, it's, it's sort of the other way around. That that. A lot of times, uh, DOTs will take their CAD files and then actually try to integrate those into, uh, um, you know, into the GIS uh, uh, for for asset inventory and so forth. Yeah, that's that's a good question. Yes, U UDOT does do that. They've been doing this for. Uh, two years now so they now uh, design in 3d uh, the contract documents are in 3d and the contractor returns the as built in 3d and during those steps there is one region in particular in utah region four that shares plan in hand ps and e 90% all in ArcGIS. So you can go to, again, UPlan, you can go to Region 4, you can go to their projects, and you can see their projects in design in 3D in ArcGIS. Okay. And uh, actually, well, I guess while we're there, Stan, can you briefly talk about how design has actually used the, uh, the Manly data? So they've they've actually found great great use uh, for it as well. Yes. Yes. Um, the biggest success they have a couple of successes, but I, I think the biggest one is uh, for the designers in on the call. Uh, a lot of your projects are preservation rehabilitation. You're not changing the horizontal vertical curvature. You're putting out details, uh, specifications, and summary sheets. 
So UDOT has created apps to take the manly data, all the assets, uh, the pavement width, and they can produce a uh, pavement preservation rehabilitation design uh, for bid in 10 minutes. Uh, it's integration of the manly data into their uh, design process. Of course, they take uh, that out to the field and spot check it. Yes, those are four signs. Yes, the road really was 36.5 feet wide. Uh, yes, those are the manholes that have to be all rebuilt because there are concrete rings around them. So, yeah, yeah design has found it very helpful for those simple designs to do. But they've also taken the LIDAR and converted it, cali converted it to from mapping grade to survey grade on a couple of projects and redesigned interstates, a few interstates in Utah. Okay, thanks, Dan. So, uh, Eric, here's one for you. Uh, what is the 3D pavement profiler that you used? Uh, Manly uses a, an LCMS, uh, laser crack measurement system, uh, produced by a company called Pave Metrics. Okay. Uh, let's see. Another one. This one, uh, well, let's see. Eric, while we're with you, uh, any recommendations on dealing with different coordinate systems offered by the various uh, data set sources? So I guess, uh, I guess integration of various coordinate systems is really the question. Uh, sure, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, we, we do often uh, find that converting between coordinate systems can come with uh, some some issues, um, especially when you are focused on um, accuracy of the assets or the data sets that are produced. So um, Manly typically tries to work in uh, WGS um, format throughout most of our data processing. Um, and then we save coordinate conversions until the end of our process uh, and, and also typically uh, work in very common uh, UTM um, and occasionally some other state plane systems. But uh, we also do rely heavily on uh, state DOT expertise when it comes to some of those state plane systems um, so that we can ensure any, any uh, differences, especially between um, you, you know, the, the various uh, geoids and, and the elevation issues that we run into uh, converting between coordinate systems are, are very well understood. So I, I would pay very close attention to how many conversions you're doing um, and try to stick, uh, you, you know, stick throughout and do as, as few conversions as possible. Okay. Um, Stan, uh, maybe you could... Uh First off, could you speak to the process? How did you actually get the various divisions to work together at Utah, by the way? Uh, well, having a champion is critical. Uh, knowing your, knowing the di different divisions and having worked with them over the years, uh, that was critical. Uh, but the proof was in the pudding. Uh, we did webinars with not only Manly before the RFP, we did at webinars with everybody in industry. Uh, what could you do? Uh, what is possible? What do you have challenges with? And so we formed this, this team. And we've been frustrated about silos of data over the years. So actually, it was easier said than done. Uh, it, it was easy, actually. It wasn't that hard. Okay. And so, how did uh, how did having that good asset data, how did it change the way that Utah actually did asset and maintenance management? I mean, did it make a fundamental differences and really sort of transform the way that asset management was practiced? Yeah, the asset management isn't the domain of just one group. It's responsibility of many groups. And so I think that was the biggest change. Uh, it wasn't owned by maintenance or traffic safety or my old group. And so it was this collaboration of working together. And then we were able to quickly put values, because since we knew all the signs and all the guardrail, we were able to quickly put a value to all of those. And then we could prioritize tiers of tiers one, two, and three. Tier one are the most important assets. Tier two are secondary. 
tier three are the least important assets. We, we did that based on more than just the value, but that was one of them. And, and so it helped us focus what was important and what wasn't important to the department. Okay, and one final question in the <laughs> short time we have remaining. Eric, this is probably for you. Um, it was mentioned that Utah had taken some of the LIDAR data and did some post-processing to get survey grade for use in design. Uh, the question is, what is the point density of the LIDAR data that they are provided? Okay, yeah, that's a that's a great question, and I will say it ranges from probably a maximum of around a thousand points per square meter um, to much less than that as you move away from the collection vehicle. So um, within the right of way, you might get down to you know less than um, let's say less than a hundred uh, for sure, and maybe even less than than twenty depending on conditions. But so you get a range from you know uh, upwards of a thousand. Um, to to you know uh, tailing off as you get away from uh, farther away from the vehicle. Right. Okay. Well, we'd like to thank everyone uh, for attending today. Uh, that uh, 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 ends our uh, webinar for today. Here are uh, a number of other resources that we would uh, encourage you to to um, uh, visit and to take a look at. And as we mentioned, these slides uh, along with the webinar, these slides will actually be on the GeoNet uh, Department of Transportation uh, uh, website. And then uh, within the week, uh, we'll actually have this webinar uh, up on our uh, webinar series website as well for those, uh, for your colleagues who weren't able to make it today. So again, thank you very much and hope you enjoyed uh, our presentation today. Thanks.